Every day around the world, 800 people die as a result of complications related to pregnancy and childbirth. I know that is a sad and startling way to start a video, but the truth is it's a startling and sad reality. By the time I finish this intro, it will have happened again, and by the time you get to the end of this video, at least five more lives will have been lost. But it doesn't have to be this way. Over the past several decades, medicine and our understanding of what causes maternal deaths and more importantly, how to prevent them has expanded dramatically. At this point, preventing maternal mortality is more about access and action than it is knowledge or understanding. As part of their sustainable development goals, in 2015, the United Nations made maternal mortality a key indicator. As part of their targets under this goal, they aim to reduce global maternal mortality rates from 150 and 100,000 live births to less than 70 and 100,000 live births by 2030. But who is keeping them accountable with regards to this goal? I've partnered with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, not only for this video, but also for me to travel from New Zealand all the way to New York City later this week to attend their goalkeepers conference. I am humbled and honored to be tasked with not only attending and learning, but also sharing with you the information that I gather and also the information from their 2023 goalkeepers report on maternal and neonatal health around the world. In 2015, the United Nations adopted a set of 17 sustainable development goals, which are meant to make the world a healthier, more equitable, and more sustainable place by 2030. The goals range from ensuring access to clean energy, to making more sustainable cities, and to good health and well-being, which is the third of the goals and most important to what we are discussing here today. Goalkeepers is exactly what it sounds like, an initiative started by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation meant to oversee and keep track of progress on these goals. That includes both an annual report on one of the key indicators, as well as a conference focused on the topic for that year. That leads me to this year's report, which I mentioned is all about maternal and neonatal health. And I wanted to talk about it because it's obviously incredibly important, but also because we are not on track in any way to meet the goals set forth by the United Nations in 2015. Maternal and neonatal mortality rates are both higher than they should be and intricately involved with one another. I have a couple of charts that I'll show you from the 2023 Goalkeepers Report. The first one is neonatal mortality rates around the world, and this is tracked in deaths per 1,000 live births. You can see that this number is declining, which is great. We want to see it on the decline. But if you look over to the right-hand side of this graph, you will see that it is nowhere near being on track to be at the point that the United Nations SDG goals had put it at as a target. The second graph I want to show you is maternal mortality rates, which unfortunately is no better and possibly significantly worse. As you can see, in the early 2000s, we made great progress in reducing maternal mortality rates around the world. However, since the introduction of the goals in 2015, we really haven't seen a lot of downward movement of maternal mortality rates. It seems to have pretty well plateaued. And if you look over to the right side of this graph, that means we are nowhere near being on track to meet the 2030 goals set forth by the United Nations. We also know, based on extensive publications on this topic, that in high-income countries like the United States, people of color, including but not limited to Black and Indigenous women and AFAB people, die at rates that are significantly higher, sometimes up to three to five times higher than their white counterparts, even when you control for education and socioeconomic status. So what do we do? We know what causes these deaths, and we know in large part how to prevent them. But knowledge means nothing if it doesn't end up putting tools into the hands of the people who need them. In the 2023 Goalkeepers Report, utilizing changemakers who are doing amazing things around the world, they have compiled a list of low-cost innovations which have the potential to save thousands of lives and move us closer to those 2030 goals. Most of the interventions that we're going to talk about today are low-cost innovations that are easily transportable that could make a massive difference, especially in low- and middle-income countries where maternity mortality rates are the highest and small changes could have major impacts. Obstetric hemorrhage kills almost 70,000 people every single year, making it the number one cause of pregnancy-related death around the world. That is, 
27% of everyone who dies related to their pregnancy is killed by massive bleeding. If that bleeding occurs around the time of delivery, just after delivery, this is called a postpartum hemorrhage. And that is defined as losing half a liter or more, so 500 milliliters or more of blood loss after delivery. We know that early intervention is the key to preventing people from having severe morbidity, meaning bad outcomes, or mortality, meaning death, related to obstetric hemorrhage. But you can't intervene early unless you recognize early that it is happening. Dr. Hadiza Galadenche is an ob in Africa who, along with a team of researchers, looked into deaths related to obstetric hemorrhage in Africa and found that up to 50% of all of these people who died from obstetric hemorrhage in their study were not even diagnosed as having a postpartum hemorrhage. This means that half of the people that they looked at didn't even have the opportunity to get treated to prevent or stop their hemorrhage because it wasn't even recognized when it was happening. Getting something as simple as a calibrated obstetric drape that includes a visual representation of how much blood loss has occurred into the hands of birth workers in these areas could be an incredibly important first step to reducing the rate of maternal mortality from obstetric hemorrhage. Of course, this is just a first step because in order to prevent bad outcomes from hemorrhage, you not only have to be able to recognize it, but also to treat it when you do recognize it. And that's where something called a postpartum hemorrhage bundle comes in. Now, traditionally, we have used what I'm going to talk about in this bundle in a kind of sequential order, meaning you use the first intervention. If that doesn't work, they're still bleeding. You move on to the second one. But what Dr. Hadija Galadinchi's team has found is that employing all of these five postpartum hemorrhage bundles together at the same time or in close proximity to each other, rather than only moving to the next one if the first one doesn't work, is much more effective in reducing bad outcomes and deaths related to obstetric hemorrhage. The five things included in the bundle that they talk about in the 2023 Goalkeepers Report are fundal massage, which is rubbing the top of the uterus or the uterine fundus to help it contract down. That is helpful for an obstetric hemorrhage that is caused by atony or the uterus being too relaxed and not contracted enough. The second one is a medication called tranexamic acid. This can be given either orally or by IV and helps reduce bleeding. This is used not only in obstetric hemorrhage, but actually found its footing for treatment of major bleeding kind of in the trauma and surgical community where it was largely used for major like motor vehicle accidents, gunshot wounds, things like that. And we have in the past probably decade really started using it a lot in obstetrics and it is incredibly helpful for obstetric hemorrhage. The third one is a group of medications that help the uterus contract down. And there's a whole lot of different medications included in that, one that a lot of you are probably familiar with, which is oxytocin and several others as well. The fourth one is IV fluids, so helping to increase the vascular volume of somebody who is bleeding is very helpful when they are having severe bleeding. And the fifth one is an examination of the genital tract. That's because some amount of obstetric hemorrhage is related to vaginal or cervical lacerations, which are needing to be sewn, and none of the medications or tools in this toolkit will help if it is caused from a laceration, except maybe the tranexamic acid. But the best thing you can do if that is the cause is to put stitches in it and stop the bleeding that way. So Dr. Galadinche and her team did a trial with over 200,000 women included, and what they found was when these five interventions were employed, at the same time, rather than only using one if the one before it didn't work, there was a 60% reduction in the amount of severe bleeding that they saw. This is a massive number and something that is fairly easy to employ if the birth workers have the tools they need to recognize that a hemorrhage is happening and treat it with these relatively low cost and fairly easy to transport and access medications and tools. Something that I think is really important is not just figuring out how do we diagnose and treat obstetric hemorrhage, but how can we actually prevent it or reduce how catastrophic the effects are from it 
before we even have the event occur. And one of the things that the 2023 Goalkeepers Report talks about is anemia. Now, anemia is extremely common in pregnancy for a whole variety of reasons, but iron deficiency anemia in pregnancy is really common. Probably over a third of people during pregnancy will have some level of anemia. And that number is as high in some places like South Asia as 80%. So this is incredibly pervasive. Now, in places like high income countries, most of the time we tell people to take iron tablets and that will help improve their anemia. Unfortunately, this requires about 180 days of really consistently using the iron tablets to make much of a difference in your levels of iron. Unfortunately, accessing enough iron tablets and being able to consistently take them on a regimen that you need to for the amount of days that you need to is incredibly difficult or if not impossible for a large percentage of people who have severe anemia in low and middle income countries and developing nations. So what can we do about that? Well, let me introduce you to Nigerian OBGYN Dr. Bosetti Afalabi, who is working so hard to make IV iron more accessible. IV iron can be administered over the course of about 15 minutes to people with severe iron deficiency during pregnancy and make a massive impact on iron levels and anemia leading up to the time of delivery. It's a fairly stable medication. It's administered over the course of only about 15 minutes. And just that one dose can make a massive impact on somebody's iron levels and hemoglobin levels going into delivery, which means if you do have an obstetric hemorrhage, you are more likely to tolerate that blood loss without a major bad outcome, and you're less likely to die from it. One in 10 pregnancy-related deaths around the world is caused by sepsis. Sepsis is an infection where bacteria gets into the blood and causes a system-wide inflammatory response that is life-threatening and can be incredibly quick to cause someone to go from fairly healthy to extremely ill. In pregnancy and related to birth, most of the time sepsis like this is going to be caused by an infection that happens in the uterus, either during the pregnancy chorioamnionitis, or after delivery called endometritis, but it can be caused by pretty well anything, including a urinary tract infection and any other type of infection that you can think of. A recent research trial in Sub-Saharan Africa was done giving women who went into labor a dose of a medication called azithromycin. Now, this is a relatively common and fairly inexpensive antibiotic that can be taken orally and is safe to use during pregnancy. What the researchers in this trial found is that the women who took that azithromycin at the onset of labor ended up showing a one-third decrease in the number of sepsis cases that they saw in that patient population. That is a big number, but it's even bigger when you think about the fact that I just told you that one in 10 pregnancy-related deaths around the world is related to sepsis. So if we could decrease sepsis by a third, that would make a massive impact not only on maternal mortality, but also on the morbidity or bad outcomes where people don't die, but they have a serious complication related to that. I can't fit it all in here, and I wanted to focus on kind of the highlights, which are what's related specifically to my field of medicine and reducing maternal mortality. But an equally important objective of the Sustainable Development Goals is to reduce neonatal and early childhood mortality. And the 2023 Goalkeepers Report does touch on this as well. They talk about things like access to corticosteroids for expected preterm delivery, as well as adequate nutrition and prevention of pneumonia in young children. I don't have time to go into all of that here, so I will link the Goalkeepers 2023 report down below if you're interested in reading through that. If there's one takeaway I want you to have from this video and the 2023 Goalkeepers report and my involvement with them in general, it is that we can reduce maternal and neonatal mortality rates around the world. We can get on track to meet the 2030 United Nations goal of reducing maternal and neonatal mortality to the targets that they set. But this is not going to happen in the absence of us learning how that happens and also 
working to make an effort to get these tools into the hands of the people who need them. Follow me on Instagram if you want to tag along for the Goalkeepers Conference and hear from some of these amazing change makers from around the world who are committed to the goals that I talked about in this video. I'll be sharing what I learn, what can be done, what is still needing to be done, and most importantly, I think how you and I can advocate for the people with the power to invest their time and money into reducing preventable deaths for moms and babies around the world.